Hi, my name is Dr. Jeff Tomberlin with Texas Cooperative Extension. I'm an entomologist, which means I study insects. And today's segment is actually going to focus on insects and where you can locate them. When one considers what an insect is and where it lives, it is amazing to realize the diversity that exists. Presently, uh, worldwide, there's an estimated 750,000 known insect species. So when deciding on where to go and what to look for in terms of insects, try not to limit oneself to butterflies and the obvious that's in front of you. If you consider the environment that's around me today, you'll notice that there's a lot of diversity, ranging from this tree to my left to a pond to my right. And within each of these different environments, you can expect to find different insects. These insects are enjoyable to watch uh, in nature as well as to collect and preserve for one's collection. So what I'd like to talk about before we go out and look at some of these sites is why do we see so many insects in so many different environments? Well, what we're referring to here is different niches or different localities of insects uh, where insects may live. If you consider the fact that insects inhabit just about every known habitat that exists worldwide, you can understand the diversity that exists. Uh, the reason that we have such diversity is because of these different environments. Insects have been selected to uh, take advantage of resources that are available in these different environments, and they have specialized. So we may have one group of insects that will colonize, say, a dead log, while we may have a totally different group of insects that will live in water. So with that, let's go see what we can find. Okay, so the first environment that we're going to look at uh, are actually looking at trees. Trees, uh, of course, they abound, uh, they're everywhere, and each one can inhabit or have different insects that may be present. If you look here, what do you see? Well, most people would say, well, I see a tree. Well, in fact, there are two different habitats here. We have the living tree, which will have its own constituents of insects that will live in it, and we have this dead tree here. If a tree is alive, there will be specific insects that will bore into it and live underneath the bark, as well as those insects that are obvious to our own naked eye on the surface and spin webs. And then there are those that will live in the leaves that we see on the branches. And each one of these habitats will allow you to find different insects. So when looking at a tree, think about sampling these different environments. The surface of the bark, underneath the bark, and looking at the leaves on the limbs. When dealing with dead trees, the same can be true, excluding the leaves, of course. We're talking about what's on the surface of the dead tree, what's underneath the surface, and what may be on the ground below the trunk of the tree. So when we're looking at this dead tree, there's something to notice uh, specific about this one region right here. Mainly that you have bark on the surface, and if you peel this away, you will find that there is insect activity underneath. And that's evident by these holes that are bored into the wood. Now, you may be lucky enough to catch the insects on the surface underneath the bark, but in some instances, you have to go into the wood itself. So if we were to peel this back, you'll notice that there are holes bored into the wood, and this is where the wood-borne insects live. Now, ideally, what you would want to do is to break some of this material off, place it into a, a white or black pan, and then you could break it apart and look for those insects that might be present. Something that's really neat that you can do is also you can find the insect galleries, what the galleries are or where the insects live. And you can actually use this to demonstrate to students how insects carry out their life cycle. What do you think of when you think of an island? Now I'm sure most people like to think of Hawaii or an island in the Caribbean. But when I think of an island as an entomologist, believe it or not, I think of other things. Uh, island biogeography, which is a uh, ecological concept that says that uh, resources that are isolated are an island to themselves. That is no different than this cow pat that we see here in front of us. It's a, an ephemeral resource, which means that it will degrade and disappear over time. However, it is a resource, and there are insects that are specific to this particular environment. In fact, right now, just looking at it, I see a variety of different insects and arthropods present, ranging from fire ants to spiders. Uh, underneath the cow pad uh, should be a, a variety of different insects that will be present, uh, ranging from beetles to fly larvae. Uh, this is an excellent resource to look at insects that affect cattle. And uh, what you may want to consider doing is wearing gloves, definitely. And as I peel, 
this back. What you'll notice is that there's a lot of isopod activity underneath the soil. But what's really fascinating is if you see the holes here, uh, these are dung beetle holes. And what that means is that the dung beetle, which is a feeder on uh, manure, is degrading the manure down. So what they do is they roll up balls of manure and bury it down in the soil and their offspring feeds on the manure. And that's a form of recyclement that we see in nature. So when thinking about insects and where to collect them, don't limit yourself to what might be considered uh, the easy habitats, such as a uh, butterfly flying through the, the field. Don't forget to look under those resources that might not be t quite as appealing, such as manure pads. As I mentioned, uh, wood is a common source for insects. Uh, we talked about dead wood, such as dead trees and logs, and we also talked about the living uh, plants and trees. One thing uh, to keep in mind is that logs that are on the ground that are heavily decomposed, and what I mean by that is that they're easily broken apart with your hand, contain a lot of moisture. Uh, there can be a series of different insects and other arthropods that may be present. Now, for example, this log that we're looking at right here, it's not necessarily what's on top of it. Uh, don't let that deceive you. Uh, what's important is to look underneath uh, where a lot of moisture will accumulate. So if we were to wheel this back, uh, what you'll notice is that there's uh, a fair amount of uh, moisture down here and there's a, a, there is some arthropod activity. So you need to be quick because most of these arthropods, most of these insects that are underneath the log uh, do not like light and when you expose them, they're gonna to try to uh, get away from you. So you wanna be ready with your forceps uh, to capture whatever you see in front of you. But always exercise caution when working in environments like this because there are some things that may be present here in Central Texas uh, with scorpions and some other things that may be um, underneath the log. But again, this is another great environment uh, where to locate insects and arthropods for your collection. As I mentioned, uh, there are a variety of different habitats where insects are located. And sometimes uh, there are certain tools that are needed uh, to help you with your insect collection. Of course, when we're talking about wood and trees, you'll need uh, a knife or something to cut into the wood. Uh, if we're dealing with uh, cow pads or other sources, you need a, a, sh a shovel or a trowel of some sort to dig into the manure. Uh, but when we're dealing with other sources such as uh, vegetation like you see here, uh, the simplest uh, method to be implemented for collecting insects is a beet sheet. Now, beet sheet sounds fancy, but really what it is is nothing more than a uh, piece of canvas such as you see here that has two dowels holding it together. And the idea is that there are many insects that live on these plants. We just don't see them because many of them are camouflaged. And what you want to do is you want to take your white sheet and you want to lay it down flat on the ground and you want to take the plant that you're, you're interested in sampling and beat on the cloth, for example. Now, two things there. One, the plant is still alive and in the ground, which is good. And the second is we have our sample of arthropods and insects here on the sheet. For example, we have a spider here and we have one ant here and we have a uh, hemiptera or true bug right here. So just in that one sample, I was able to get three different insect groups. So when thinking about collecting insects, don't forget about the little plant out in the front yard that maybe ha may have something of interest. When sampling plants, uh, beet sheets are, are a great way to uh, collect insects off of the plants, but sometimes uh, beet sheets just not available. Uh, but there is an alternative that can be used and that is a five gallon bucket. This is uh, just as uh, dependable as a beet sheet and it's a lot more durable. Uh, the concept is still the same as with the beet sheet. What you want to do is you want to take the plant that you have an interest in and you want to place the plant in the bucket and you want to beat it against the side. And then what you do is you have your insects isolated in the bucket. Now, there are a couple advantages to the bucket. Uh, one is the insects, uh, if they are flightless, cannot get away from you. You have them here in the bucket, and that makes it easier for collecting. Uh, also, buckets are a lot more durable, and they're easily stored, and who knows, you may have another use for it around your home. 
Another resource that harbors a tremendous uh, diversity of insects uh, is carrion. What is carrion? Uh, anything that's decomposing, that's uh, of animal flesh. Uh, definitely not one of the more pleasant environments to sample due to smell and context. However, uh, there are a tremendous number of different insects that will be present here. Now this right here is a, an animal that's been dead for several weeks and, and there doesn't appear to be much activity. However, again, just like other resources, what's on the surface can be deceiving. Uh, what you would want to do is look underneath the resource. And this is where you'll see the activity. And what I see when I look in here is uh, beetle larvae and adults uh, that are present. And I also see uh, fire ants and other insects, uh, fly maggots that are present. So if there is interest in sampling uh, insects that are common on decomposing material, uh, I would exercise some caution, definitely use gloves, uh, and remember to wash your hands when you're finished uh, because this is a, uh, a toxic environment. Other environments that have insect activity that often are overlooked are with animals and livestock. If uh, you own a dog or a cat, there are insects that are specific. I'm sure that most of you think about ticks and fleas. However, there are many flies and beetles that are associated with the animal and with the food of the animal. Behind me, for example, we have uh, goats. Uh, if you have livestock at your home, uh, that's a nice place to go look uh, for insect activity. Of course, you'll look within the facilities as well as on the animal. So when thinking about insects and trying to find uh, different types, don't rule out animals. Leaf litter and soil are other sites where we can find insects living. Uh, what we have in front of us today is just a simulation of uh, a soil or leaf litter sample. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can sort those insects from that material. Because many of these insects can be small and can be difficult to locate. So what we have here is this is material that simulates soil or leaf litter. Now the main object that what you want to do is you want to separate as much of that loose material uh, from the insects as possible. So what you want to do is you would like to construct a sieve such as what you see here. Basically what I have is two by fours nailed together with a a wire mesh on the bottom. And what you do is you place that over an empty container and you take the sample, be it the leaf litter or soil, and you pour that onto the sieve. Of course you shake it and what that does is it separates the loose, the loose material uh, from the insects and the larger material which may harbor uh, the insects and other arthropods. So again, the way it works is you get your leaf sample or litter sample, place it into a garbage bag, bring it to a place where you can work with it, empty it into your sieve, shake your sieve, separate that material out, and then you can place that into a Berlazi funnel. So when dealing with soil samples and leaf litter, the ideal way to isolate those insects and arthropods that are present is to use a Berlazi funnel. So I'm sure right now you're going, what is a Berlazi funnel? Well, simply stated, a Berlazi funnel is a device used to separate those insects and arthropods from a leaf litter soil source. Uh, what it is, it's uh, usually a, a funnel that's attached to a uh, cylindrical tube, such as what you see here, a bucket. Inside, uh, there's a mesh, such as you see here. And on top of the mesh is usually a piece of cardboard, such, uh, cardboard or uh, paper bag, as you see here, just a piece of paper that you sit on top of the wire mesh. And when you sort your leaf litter sample, you take your leaf litter and you put on top of that paper inside the Berlazi funnel. Then what you do is you attach a light source, such as you see here, to the top. And the way it works is that the heat from the light will dry the source, or the sample. As the sample dry, dries, the insects will migrate out of that sample and typically fall through the funnel into a collection container that's at the bottom of the funnel. Now inside that funnel, it's best to put alcohol, 80% uh, ethanol or 80% isopropyl, which is rubbing alcohol, in that container and as those insects collect, it will preserve them. Now don't feel that you have to go out and buy a Berlazi funnel from an entomological supplier. I mean, that is an option if you want to do so. 
But these are easy to construct at home. Uh, basically what you need is a funnel that you can attach to a mason jar, such as you see here. And inside that funnel, you want to put a piece of mesh uh, that will hold your leaf litter sample. That simple uh, Berlazi funnel will work uh, well enough to isolate insects from a leaf litter sample. Uh, the natural drying of the leaf litter will occur, and those insects will fall through the funnel into your uh, alcohol source. So this is an example of how to isolate insects from uh, leaf litter and soil samples. Flowers, while aesthetically pleasing, are an excellent opportunity to collect insects. What do I mean by that? Well, there are many plants that can be purchased and planted around your home and school that will serve as attractants for butterflies, bees, and many mimics. Mimics are those insects that appear as others when in fact they are not. So when considering on having an uh, entomology session in your classroom, you may want to consider having a butterfly garden uh, they're easy to maintain and they re-emerge uh, each year and they will attract, a numerous, uh, will attract numerous types of insects to your yard uh, for collecting.